Well, thank you, Andrew, and um, thank you, everyone, for the chance to be with you today. And by all means, congratulations on the 100th anniversary of Angus Australia. It's my pleasure today to talk to you a little bit about some predictions for 2030 and genetics in 2030. I'm reminded that it's dangerous to make predictions, isn't it? Because whether it be the weather or markets, uh, oftentimes the forecasters are proven wrong and they end up uh, looking kind of ridiculous. But um, I'd like to start with something and have a little fun with you today. I found this Chinese philosopher who had a thing or two to say about predictions, and he said, those who have knowledge don't predict, but those who predict don't have knowledge. Um, Andrew, I don't know what that says about those of us that are in the genetic prediction business. Uh, perhaps it implies that we aren't all that knowledgeable, and uh, certainly the future may prove that to be. Rather than the term predict the future in 2030, I prefer to think about it as maybe giving you some vision or some insight as to what 2030 might look like and how we might prepare for it. And I, uh, I prefer the philosophy here out of Proverbs where it says, the, where there is no vision, people perish. So I'm going to submit to you some ideas and, um, and hopefully have you think about um, how fast things have changed in the last 10 or so years, especially the 100 years, and maybe start to consider um, what it's going to look like in 2030. There's a newsletter I like to follow, and you've probably seen it. It's the Kiplinger newsletter. And as a way to stimulate our thinking about genetics, we might just think about life in general and some of the forecasts that have been made by those that like to predict life in the future. Um, this is an abbreviated list, and I'll just kind of highlight the purple highlighted uh, points here. But there's some amazing things that are likely to come to fruition by 2030. One of the predictions by Kip Kiplinger is that your refrigerator will handle the grocery shopping. And between you and me, I hope it's always telling uh, those in control to, to stock the fridge with plenty of Angus beef. Also, um, one of the predictions was that your food will be grown vertically. And I don't know about in Australia, but um, cell-mediated and cell-produced um, protein products um, we prefer to call them fake meat or fake beef, are becoming um, quite the talk. And by 2030, if not before, we're likely to see those as a threat. Obviously, um, everyone's heard the forecasts about um, cars that drive and park themselves, and it's planting season back home, and already we've got autonomous tractors that are actually doing field work uh, with no manual intervention. I also was um, kind of intrigued by this whole notion that wearables and implanted microchips will make, will make sure that you take your pills. So those of us that are in the ester synchronization business, wouldn't it be cool if one trip through the chute enabled all the synchronization necessary whereby due to time release of various products, it would uh, save our time and effort. And finally, I thought it was interesting that they're predicting very personalized, genetic, um, tailored uh, treatments for health. I also found the last one kind of interesting. Your smartphone will record your location and every word you say. Uh, I think that leads to this alternative headline where, welcome to 2030, I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. So Let's, let's, between us, hope that we do have privacy and, and hope 2030 uh, lends itself to fun life. Um, as an outline today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some headlines that we've seen in the news that we think might uh, forecast some of the things ahead in the next decade. Um, maybe highlight some genetic opportunities as we see them. And then also, beyond what we predict, how do we make wisest, best use of those predictions to drive profit for us and our commercial bull customers. One of the headlines that was just out earlier this week while I was traveling, and for those of you that have a scientific technical um, interest, the USDA just published their Genome to Phenome Improving Animal Health Production and Well-Being uh, template between now and 2027. 20, uh, this is a long but really interesting read, and I thought it was very, very insightful and so 
If you have a technical interest, I would very much encourage you to pull this up and uh, look at it and, and think about it, both as breeders and as a breed association. This was an interesting headline earlier in May, and it caught a lot of eyes. Walmart is now beginning to assemble an unprecedented Angus beef supply chain strategy. So they're obviously exploiting the brand recognition of certified Angus beef, but trying to build upon that and go beyond in our country the qualification based on black hide to really dive in and be able to communicate to consumers where their beef comes from and how it was raised. And you've no doubt also started to see the headlines, the top two are from the United States and the bottom two are from here in Australia, about how the use of blockchain technology is integrating all sorts of different food supply chains where an animal's information enters an electronic ledger, and then different um, people along the supply chain can extract information from the ledger, as well as contribute information to the ledger. And while that may seem far-fetched today, um, by 2030, I would imagine we have a lot of these supply chains up and operational. So generally, I would submit to you, um, and especially to those of you that have 30, 40, or more years left as your careers in this business, we are really moving from a time where we were a segmented supply chain that included seed stock, cow-calf, stalker or backgrounder, or calf grower, feedlot, packer, distributor, and consumer, to one that's much more um, streamlined to a supply chain that um, is more united and is more willing to share and use information to make the whole chain uh, more efficient. So with that said, and with that background, um, I'd like to share with you just a few of the genetic uh, opportunities that we see, and maybe reflect on the current state of the technology as I do so. Uh, congratulations go out to Angus Australia for their implementation of single step. It's really the uh, state of art way to blend all available information, including pedigree, uh, phenotypes, as well as genomic information. The takeaway is that that drives accuracy for young non-parent animals. It means that the EBVs are more dependable and that there's less risk and fewer mistakes associated with our selection and mating decisions. We work with Angus Genetics Inc. and um, from a breeder and commercial bull buyer perspective, we like to use the term progeny equivalence when a producer asks us what the benefit is of selling as well as buying bulls and, and seed stock animals that have been genomically tested. And what progeny equivalents attempt to do is answer the question, in conventional non-genomic enhanced genetic evaluation, how many offspring, daughters, or carcasses would otherwise be required to achieve the same level of accuracy as what genomics give you immediately? As you can see, for most of the traits, and we've summed these across the categories of maternal growth and efficiency and carcass traits, the um, progeny equivalence, the additional accuracy that the marker information provides, jump starts the EBV such that it has accuracy similar to what otherwise would require the better part of a first calf crop with phenotypes contributing to the evaluation. Now the question is, by 2030, what might be the progeny equivalents and how accuracy my animals get. And that um, obviously is dependent upon adoption of the technology, the submission of additional phenotypes, and the assembly of markers that are all the more informative. It's really been this whole notion of achieving the better part of the first calf crop and progeny equivalents that has driven the adoption of genomic technology in the United States. You know, currently across the different brief breeds, we feel like we're sitting on about 800,000 animals with genotypes, and obviously Angus is leading the way with over 550,000 genotypes that are distributed among animals located nationwide. And by the green dots, you can definitely see where our seed stock industry is located, mostly in the center portion of the country. I also would submit to you that by 2030, we as breeders may think differently about accuracy. So currently I'm one that um, is moderate in my tolerance to accuracy, so I would normally pick a combination of bulls that are proven, and then maybe a few that are either not yet carcass and daughter proven, but might be proven for cavities and growth. Um, 
in 2030, my goal, or I think the aspiration we should all have as breeders and breed associations, would be to have our technology deliver effectively high accuracy for non-parent animals, whereby accuracy may not matter so much. And as a precursor of this, it's really interesting in the dairy industry currently in the US, in that the proportion, I should say the average age of AI sires in the latest 2018 crop of Holstein is one third younger than it was uh, six years ago. So they're obviously uh, using a lot more young genetically elite sires earlier, uh, decreasing the generation interval and speeding genetic progress, and they're doing that uh, through more accurate predictions on young superior animals. So I think that's interesting to think about. It's also, um, for those of you that went to Dr. Garrick's talk this morning, I thought that was particularly thought-provoking about predictions for additional traits that might be needed to best describe differences in the profitability of animals. I've just categorized these into three traits here. We obviously, as an animal health company, are excited about all the work being done on the health traits. Um, we're interested in all the different strategies, as Dr. Hines communicated, about um, how we might predict genetic differences in immunity or response to um, uh, a disease challenge or preempt things and select animals that are more bulletproof to begin with. I'll show you an example of that here in a minute, and I think that's perhaps a precursor of things to come, particularly in beef cattle. As Dr. Garrick pointed out, we think there's opportunity to evaluate animals uh, for more maternal fitness and adaptability across a wide variety of traits. Um, we have uh, the benefit of um, working with some Angus breeders, and I think this list would cover most of the traits that we're at least thinking about uh, currently. And I think um, all these traits are of economic significance, whereby they would be important in most people's profit function. I'd also throw out another category of traits that I think is um, open ground yet to be plowed, and that is this whole notion of being able to select for the durability of our bulls uh, to go out and last for many uh, breeding seasons and produce a lot of calves uh, per bull and not break down for either structural or semen quality issues. And, and I would um, challenge you to add to this list. You no doubt as breeders have things that you've observed over the years that are important. Um, by all means, engage in your breed association to scope those new traits that uh, you can collect in volume that can give you more insights to the traits that might um, better describe your profit function. This is just a, a picture of those. So obviously, respiratory is highest on our priority list. I'll show you that in a minute relative to dairy. Being inventory-based in your recording system where you're keeping track of your breeding and your pregnancy checking and reasons why cows are cold and reasons why cows maybe don't have calves I think is incredibly important. Uh, components of the breeding soundness exam and, and bull durability as well as uh, traits that might affect maternal longevity such as teat and other function. We um, work in the dairy space with a product we call Clarified. It's a very comprehensive product and includes predictions for nearly 30 different production traits. In the middle two bars of this slide, you see it also includes predictions for cow wellness traits as well as calf wellness traits, and then also a variety of genetic conditions. Um, just to add some additional context to the whole idea of selecting for greater immunity, I really have confidence that this kind of thing is going to work, and I'm delighted to hear the investment that Angus has made in doing uh, this sort of work in Angus cattle. Relative to our clarified product, one of the calf wellness traits is susceptibility to respiratory disease. The line on the table here indicates the genetic merit of animals, and the bar indicates the incidence of calf respiratory disease. And this is a validation study that uh, we routinely do with all our predictions in all of our different markets where we um, implement um, genetic uh, and genomic um, enhanced uh, genetic evaluations. 
As you can see, um, these things, although lowly heritable, really do respond to selection and really are associated with observed phenotypes for the traits. In this instance, the category on your far left, which has the worst uh, genetic merit for susceptibility to respiratory disease, um, also had the highest incidence of respiratory disease. And when we break these down into quartiles of genetic merit, you can see the high genetic merit animals uh, that are more resistant also had the lowest, in the blue bars, the lowest observed incidence of respiratory disease. And we see um, results like this over and over again across all the cow and calf wellness traits. And um, we're excited about the prospect and we're excited about all the research that's going on to strategically address this issue. One of the things that's helping us in the dairy world is just the quantity of data and the quantity of genotyped animals. We're in this last year now, it approaches three million head of um, dairy animals. As you can see, as the bottom chart indicates, as it relates to their economic profit function, the dairy industry has turned around the negative uh, response in reproduction um, in recent years and really has now sustained improvement in profit as it relates to the bottom. I also would submit to you that in the year 2030, there's gonna be new technologies that are just now coming online to make the collection of phenotypes more automated and make the submission more streamlined. We're working with a technology called SmartBow in dairies and a companion technology called Advex that's applied to feeder cattle in feedlots, whereby a, a, an ear tag, a radio frequency ear tag, monitors animals and monitors all kinds of things about the animal. And they can tell the duration of rumination, the duration of eating at the bunk. Um, they can also get a read on which animals are in heat. And um, our, our forecast is that we're moving in the next uh, very short time period to what we call precision animal management. The, the, the similarity would be precision farming, where you marry up GPS with soil maps, with your plant populations, and with fertilization. And we see the same thing coming down the pipe for both dairy as well as beef cattle. We have some really interesting things already emerging in beef cattle, so dairy, or in dairy cattle. Dairy cattle are getting very sophisticated in the, in the way they manage their cow inventory. If you consider this normal distribution, whereby the dairy wellness profit dollars, where animals are ranked according to their profitability that include the wellness as well as production traits, dairies are getting very sophisticated, whereby they're using sexed heifer semen to produce um, genetically elite females for replacement from the top end of their cows. And then so as to um, not produce a lower value animal, they're strategically mating uh, the bottom portion of their distribution to beef sires to make a more valuable beef dairy cross animal. And we're getting to the point now where um, all the major studs are actually selling more beef semen driven by Angus semen sales into the dairy industry than they are selling beef semen to beef producers. And so we think that's an interesting opportunity in the future to enhance efficiency across the whole beef and dairy supply chain. We also think that some basic science investment is really needed to pave the way for 2030. And I'm happy to share that in 2018, Zoetis invested in developing a whole reference genome, a complete sequence of an Angus animal. Previously, a lot of our DNA markers were derived from the Line 1 Hereford cow in Montana. But um, one thing that paved the way for our dairy wellness traits was having a Holstein complete sequence. And so we've done that in Angus as well and are hopeful that that'll be insightful as we develop predictions for new uh, and difficult and expensive and hard to measure traits in the future. Beyond the actual predictions and the expansion of traits for which we might have predictions in 2030, I would submit that uh, the way in which we use the predictions is likely to become more sophisticated even though we only have two things at our disposal to improve the profitability of animals, that meaning being selection and mating, um, I think we're going to have decision support tools 
that enable us to optimize these things and, and help us and, and help the eye of the master breeder um, make those decisions better and make those decisions more efficiently. And that really then comes down to what Dr. Doric said, and I would um, challenge you to think about this. I know in my own beef cattle uh, herd, I sure think about, you know, what, what are those things that I can select for that are truly going to maximize my profit function between now and 2030 and beyond? And, and hats off to Australian Angus for the work they've done on all of the multi-trait economic selection indexes. I think these are a savior in trying to take a lot of information on a lot of different traits and a lot of information on the economic ramifications that those traits have on both the costs as well as revenue from production and put it into one number that can be used as a screening tool for animals that represent the best profit function. And beyond the index, then, you have the individual traits that you can fall back on to select those particular sires for propagation in your program uh, to help both with the overall profit function as well as improve individual trait weaknesses. And I like that. Um, we've been working uh, with um, your Australian software that was written by Dr. Brian Kinghorn, the mate cell software. And that's uh, really interesting. And one of the components of that is to work with breeders to really uh, nail down the documentation of their desired breeding objective. And so what index is it that best represents the profit function for you and your customers? Um, what levels of inbreeding are tolerable? And what threshold levels of individual traits are of most valuable to you and, and your customers? And, Answering those questions and then marrying it up with the software really helps us to optimize. And I think the key word is optimize. So optimize that blend between the profit function described by the index, uh, tolerable levels of inbreeding, and then de desired levels of individual trait performance. And I only see the future between now and 2030 as becoming more and more um, dependent upon the use of decision support technology because of the vast array of information we have to try to digest and make sense of in our selection decisions. Just 200 cows potentially mated to 15 different candidate sires means that there's 3,000 different possible outcomes to evaluate. And it's not at all that we're trying to threaten or take away the work of the master breeder um, on both visually evaluated traits as well as um, those things that are just um, synergistic in the bulls we choose and mating them to the cows. But, but these kind of tools help us become more efficient because they'll give us the sire that is the most optimum, but then it'll give us the ranked backups so that we just have that at our disposal to think about as we build our breeding plans and make our final sire selection decisions. I also would submit to you that by 2030, we'll be more sophisticated in all likelihood about how we deliver genetic information to commercial users of Angus genetics and how knowledge from products such as Heifer Select in turn will inform wiser, smarter bull buying decisions from you as the seed stock providers. So Matt, imagine a day when your biggest bull customers know all about the strengths and the weaknesses of their cow inventory. Um, they could come to you, have mate cell run with all the bulls in your bull catalog, and then you could provide them with a prioritized list of those that were the best complement, those that best synergized with the strengths, corrected any weaknesses in that commercial cow herd, and then um, uh, make, make the best bull buying decisions possible. I also wonder, as the bottom of this slide um, questions is, in 2030, will phenotypes from tested commercial herds contribute to genetic evaluation? And for some traits, such as reproductive traits, whereby commercial herds put more pressure environmentally on expressed reproductive performance, I think some of those phenotypes could uh, find their way into um, the overall breed-wide genetic evaluation. I'm reminded that in the pork industry, as well as in the dairy industry, 
there's millions of phenotypes that are entering into the genetic evaluation of the parent uh, seed stock herds. You probably saw in that uh, early slide about headlines this whole term about phenome. And um, I would just um, offer that in 2030, if not long before that, and this was really illustrated by Christian in the SIRE benchmarking program, historically we've used phenotypes to predict genetic merit. I think more and more in the future we'll actually predict expressed performance or predict phenotypes of individuals and groups of animals using the genetic uh, predictions and the non-genetic information that's available. And obviously, it's a chicken and egg issue, right? Because one informs the other and vice versa. And it's like we'll, we'll have uh, very smart machine learning type predictions uh, whereby one um, uh, turns on, it, on itself and informs the other. I'm also reminded that immediately and in the future, it's one thing to accurately predict the genetic merit of animals for individual traits or predict the genetic merit for profitability of animals. It's quite another to make sure that we wisely use um, advanced reproductive technology to multiply the superior animals to really drive genetic change. And so it'd be um, in the more traditional sense, synchronization in AI or ET and IVF or even some of the bottom ones here. I think they'll also play a bigger role in the future. In addition to us uh, becoming more streamlined and connected across the supply chain, you know, as a company, we also feel like it's of our benefit to, to, to cover the whole continuum of care. In other words, um, use genetics to predict performance and profitability, um, use our vaccines to prevent, um, diagnose disease wisely, and then when, when appropriate, um, judiciously um, uh, treat animals. So with that, I would just offer you with a few takeaways. Um, we certainly think that globally, the demand for authenticated Angus beef and more transparent parent supply chains is sure in the new paradigm of beef production in 2030. And we're obviously very bullish that genomics can be used for many things beyond verifying pedigree and enhancing accuracy to enabling predictions for no, more traits, health reproduction, and, and others, and also help to authenticate and even audit the story of beef as, as that is delivered globally to consumers. We also think that the um, time-tested uh, accumulation of phenotypes and, and weighting the genetic predictions for the economic impact and then feeding those into decision support tools is likely in the forecast for 2030 and beyond. So with that, um, thanks so much for enabling me to share some of these things, and I hope they've been a little thought-provoking.